Welcome to Facts on the Ground. I'm Jesse Zerwell, and I'm joined today by Tim Coles. He's a postdoctoral research fellow at Plymouth University in the UK, and he recently published a piece at The Gray Zone titled In Somalia, the U.S. is bombing the very terrorists it created. So we're going to unpack today what's happened in Somalia, what's probably going to happen, and try to put that in its proper historical context. So, Tim, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for the invitation. Sure. So I know you go by Tim or TJ. Is there one you prefer? Uh, Tim is fine. Okay, great. Yeah, there are there are so many Tim Coleses around that I thought, uh, as an author, I'll put uh, my middle initial, but uh, just just among friends, Tim is fine. Okay, I just want to make sure that I'm not getting it wrong. So, <laughs> as I mentioned in that brief introduction, Somalia um, is what your piece focuses on, and it's long been a focus of. U.S. empire and Western imperialism in general. So can we start with some historical context? Somalia gained independence in 1960, but before that, what was its position, if you, were, if you will, on the world stage? Well, there was the phenomenon called the scramble for Africa, which was the European powers in the late 19th century. And um, they sought to exploit the resources of Africa, which until then had been a pretty overlooked uh, area of the world as far as the European powers were concerned. Uh, they were more concerned with uh, India and China because tour of world commerce and innovation. So the British essentially wanted to go and smash Asia to pieces and steal its technology and uh, impose what they called free trade and free markets. And uh, India in particular was the big source of imperial revenue and never got to see any of the, the ill-gotten gains. Uh, the money went to the top, uh, as usual, as it does today. Uh, so Africa was largely overlooked. But um, once it became clear that uh, the British couldn't really hold on to Asia anymore, uh, the imperial powers, including France, uh, Germany a little bit, and uh, Italy, they shifted towards Africa. And um, the excuse for the imperialism was... Um, what they called the white man's burden, that uh, white men were civilized, black people were not. So we had a, a responsibility to uh, invade and kill them and civilize the, civilize the survivors. Uh, that was the, the logic of empire. And uh, today it manifests as a responsibility to protect or humanitarian intervention. Uh, so the excuses have remained the same, but the language has changed. So Somalia, uh, which is uh, uh, East Africa on what's called the Horn of Africa, um, that was a uh, kind of rivalry between the Italians and the British. And uh, th there was a very diverse uh, agriculture. Uh, it's a nomadic population. Uh, so the people basically... Um, did some settled agriculture, they'd move on. Um, but the Italians and the British turned the vast swathes of the land into monocultures for uh, crops for export to uh, African and European markets. And this laid the basis for famines, because if you don't have a, a diverse agriculture and a diverse uh, biosphere, then um, you're susceptible to uh, famines when there are droughts. The British did the same in India, by the way. The, uh, there were very few famines in India before British imperialism because uh, Indian people could save their grain and seed, but um, the British destroyed that system. So when there was uh, climate-induced uh, droughts, there were famines. And uh, the same 
Somalia is known now for a, a place of drought and famine, uh, and it wasn't that way generally uh, before imperialism. Um, but when the uh, global economy transitioned to oil in the early part of the 20th century in particular, uh, then Somalia became a strategically important route. It wasn't just for uh, trade, it uh, became uh, important from the point of view of the, um, the British because of its strategic position. Uh, it has a uh, coast with the, the Gulf of Aden opposite Yemen in the Middle East. And um, it also, uh, it's, it's on the, the Red Sea, which leads up to the Suez Canal in Egypt. Uh, this is absolutely essential for force deployment. And that became more important, uh, particularly after the Second World War, uh, when uh, forces could be deployed rapidly to the Middle East. Um, the British Foreign Office uh, described Middle Eastern oil as, in their words, a vital prize for any power interested in world domination. Uh, so they had to get to the Middle East uh, rapidly for force, force deployment if necessary. And so several countries uh, were considered important for this. Uh, Egypt was one because of the Suez Canal. Uh, Somalia is another. Uh, Yemen too. And um, this is pretty much uh, stated in uh, secret documents of the what was then called the colonial office in more honest times. Uh, the colonial office, uh, the papers are now declassified, but they were secret at the time. And um, the, the US empire, which uh, the British Royal Institute for International Affairs describes it as uh, empire by denial. Uh, and there's a book, uh, I forget the author, but it's called How to Hide an Empire. Uh, so the US is obviously the, the global yeah. empire. Daniel uh, Emmerwall wrote that. Yeah, yeah. And um, the, the US has just taken over uh, from the British, basically. So the, the overarching strategic interest in Somalia remains the same. Anything else, uh, humanitarian intervention, counterterrorism, that's just noise. So when Somalia gained its independence in 1960, what did that look like for the country? And what did that mean for the colonial powers, especially Britain? Did they immediately pack up and leave or were, there, were they there residually? What did it look like for the country there was as far no as clear occupation? Yeah, there was no clear demarcation. So you had the phrase uh, Somali protectorate, which again goes back to the responsibility to protect doctrine. And then there's the, the idea of a commonwealth. So these countries have their quote unquote independence, but uh, the royal family in the UK is still the de facto head of state by virtue of their being part of the commonwealth. So there was no um, particular moment where you could say this is where British imperialism ended. Um, and it, of course, in any uh, colonial country that had uh, endured occupation, freedom was uh, a struggle. And um, it was, Somalia was basically carved up um, geographically uh, between Italian Somaliland and British Somaliland. And um, the USSR had uh, some interest in the country as well for similar reasons of strategic deployment, although uh, now declassified CIA documents say that the, um, the successive regimes that ran Somalia were not particularly close to the USSR. Uh, so as the, um, the, sort of the independence from Britain, which uh, was slow process, uh, transitioned into the kind of uh, neo-colonialism of the U.S. empire. The the shadow of the Cold War was cast over Somalia, so any kind of uh, U.S. weapons exports to the country could be justified uh, on the grounds of countering the Soviet Union, when in fact at the time the U.S. intelligence were saying that uh, relations between Somalia and the USSR were pretty uh, neutral most of the time. 
And did U.S. intervention, to put it lightly, in Somalia start before, during, before or during the proxy war that the U.S. waged in Afghanistan against the USSR? What's the timeline there? Well, the timeline would be that um, there was um, a regime uh, of uh, Syed Bar, who uh, this is going into the 70s now. Um, so this would have been a few years before the overt uh, U.S. support for the uh, so-called Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Uh, when the CIA realized that the Somali uh, regime was not going to uh, comply with the uh, interests of the USSR, they began to send uh, what's called aid to Somalia, which uh, mostly involved weaponry. So US weapons started to uh, flood into the country. And this created a militarized regime where the uh, armed forces personnel went from a few thousand to uh, over a hundred thousand and uh, began to launch uh, basically ethnic cleansings against uh, rival uh, communities. And um, the um, US, again, they, they had an interest in uh, Somalia strategically for force deployment, but as long as the country wasn't functioning, it served no threat. So in Egypt, for example, uh, under uh, Nasser in the 1950s, that was a, a functioning government, whether you like it or not. So uh, Nasser could um, nationalize the Suez Canal and impose high tariffs on US and other vessels that were passing through the Suez Canal. Uh, the US doesn't want a similar situation to occur in Somalia, where uh, potentially ships could um, block uh, US force deployment. So as long as there was chaos, uh, and a market for U.S. arms. Uh, the um, State Department and the CIA were quite happy with the situation in Somalia. But if there was any uh, potential for uh, a government that was antithetical to U.S. interests to actually uh, gain a foothold, uh, that's considered a potential threat. Uh, and so that would require um, what they call stabilization, which is the opposite. It's usually uh, destabilization to put the country back into more civil war, as indeed happened uh, in the 1990s. Um, there was a, the famine uh, started in 1989, the beginnings of it. Uh, by uh, late 91, it, I think it was uh, beginning to decline, uh, or 92. And um, that's when the U.S. decided that they must invade Somalia with Operation Restore Hope uh, under George H.W. Bush and then Bill Clinton. Um, this was also to support a United Nations uh, mission, uh, but actually it was um, mainly the, the U.S. interests in um, uh, the so-called warlords that were not going to be favorable to U.S. interests. Um, but then years later, they were working with the same warlords to uh, attack uh, Somali Islamists. So um, the, the context depends very much on the, the time frame. And uh, there are no, as the, the famous phrase goes, there are no real allies, just interests in international affairs. Right. So the British were essentially phased out quite quickly over just a few decades, it seems. And as the US empire grew, it replaced the British empire in Somalia. Is that essentially a, a fair way of uh, generally summarizing what happened? Yeah, um, that's, that's true uh, in most places. Um, not really India, uh, the US, um, India had a, a policy of uh, autonomy and uh, not wanting to do too much international trade. And uh, the US, as far as I can tell, I may be wrong, but the US didn't have much uh, interest at the time in India. It does now with the so-called 
free market and high tech and exploiting Indian labor. Uh, but from really the end of the Second World War, um, the US was mainly focused on uh, trying to break into China. So with that exception, uh, much of what Britain controlled fell mostly to the US at one time or another. So the US, I know a lot of people think that Israel controls US policy, but as far as I can tell, it's the US is basically using Israel as a proxy for its interests in Palestine, which is uh, what the British were doing before then. Uh, Iraq, of course, uh, is um, one of the main countries that the British had in its uh, the, the, the waning days of its uh, empire. Uh, and that's a big interest for the US. Uh, and Somalia is just another piece of this puzzle. So when does Islam come into the picture? How, how long has that been? I don't know if dominant is the right word, but let's say the dominant religion in Somalia. Well, this goes back uh, before the British into the um, the so-called uh, the, the slave trading days. Uh, we're talking like uh, 15th, 16th century. And um, there are remnants uh, in um, other British uh, colonial, former colonial countries in Africa, like Nigeria, that was basically split into two with um, Christians in one region and Muslims in another. This is how the Western intellectuals and historians like to frame it in these simple dialectics, but there's obviously much more to it than that. It's more complicated. So this tradition basically uh, continued in uh, Somalia, but the majority of Somalis are on the, again, this, this, this is just a crude way of putting it, but the kind of softer end of Islam, the Sufi, more spiritual side, rather than the, the dogmatic, um, formal uh, side of Islam. And um, that's pretty much the describes the population. That's why uh, counterterrorism experts um, didn't find the George W. Bush claims very credible that um, Islamic terrorists could get a foothold in Somalia because it's just not the sort of country that's conducive to that. If you look at um, a country that uh, the US has backed explicitly for its oil, uh, Britain too, which is Saudi Arabia, that's the, that's the perfect kind of place for um, Islamic extremism and terrorism to foment because the the Wahhabi regime is utterly corrupt and um, utterly hypocritical and um, does not practice what it preaches and what it preaches is monstrous anyway. And so uh, the more right wing elements of Islam can point to this regime and say, look, these are infidels, basically, they're not, uh, they're not uh, practicing what they preach. And they can, and because the regime is so oppressive, they can build a, a popular base. Uh, and if you look at the terrorism that followed in Iraq after 2003, when the US and Britain invaded, the majority of uh, suicide bombers or alleged suicide bombers, there are a lot of US special forces operations, by the way, so we don't really know what was going on. But anyway, let's agree it was suicide bombers. A lot of them were from Saudi Arabia and from Pakistan. They weren't Iraqis because under Saddam Hussein, it was a more secular society. And um, this is why, although there were some Islamic elements that uh, took uh, advantage of the, the vacuum created in the early 90s with Operation Restore Hope, uh, they were not, uh, it, it was not a serious threat the way, it, the way it is in what I've just described in Saudi Arabia, let's say because of the, the dynamics of the, the country. Yeah, and what's interesting about Saudi Arabia too, as far as exporting uh, jihad is that during the, the US backed proxy, the US's proxy war in Afghanistan against the USSR, the uh, Saudi Arabia was essentially a partner and matching dollar for dollar the um, 
the funding and the arming and the training of the Mujahideen uh, by the U.S. And I believe just before the Soviet Union invaded, um, there was the storming of the uh, mosque. Um, I'm forgetting exactly where that was in Saudi Arabia, but it was a huge crisis. And that was when the Saudi regime, which by that time was really in its infidel stage, um, obsessed with the getting obsessed with the materialism we see it mired in now. And they, the regime essentially struck a deal with the jihadi or Wahhabi elements of Saudi Arabia that they would export um, Wahhabism abroad uh, to Afghanistan in this case, um, in turn for being able to um, basically live in the lap of luxury as they, as they had been doing. So, um, yeah, that's just to provide some more context to what you were yeah, saying. Yeah, the Taliban uh, as well. Right. Um, the, the reports in, in the nineties, um, that looked at the, um, this fanatical purist regime of the Taliban actually said, well, you know, these guys are looking at women's lingerie when they visited the West and things like that. So we see the same sort of uh, hypocrisy, uh, which is um, quite uh, standard among human societies. People uh, seem to be indoctrinated through the media to believe in these simplistic notions of good guys and bad guys that um, these particular Muslims uh, think they're going to go to heaven, etc., and really believe in their own propaganda, uh, when actually they're just uh, at the top of a hierarchy like anybody else. So they can be corrupted and hypocritical and have their own internal logic and biases and behave in ways that appear absolutely uh, contradictory to people outside, but they seem to believe in their own, uh, believe in their own righteousness. So things are so much more complicated uh, than people uh, people can accept, uh, and I, I'm guilty of this too because I, you know, my my summaries here are kind of sketches of what's happening. There's obviously more complexity, right? And going off of that, or just to back up, I believe it was the it was uh, at Mecca where the mosque, uh, one of the holiest sites in Islam, was stormed. But I have to double check that. Anyway, if we can get to the early 1990s, as you've alluded to in our conversation a few times, what exactly happened there? Because when most people think about Somalia in the early to mid 1990s, they think of Black Hawk Down and this Western version of the U.S. military there um, not being an ocu occupying offensive force, but rather a defensive force of good guys that was ended up caught in the, the wrong place at the wrong time. So can you provide a corrective to that narrative? It was uh, 91 when the various warring factions decided to form a kind of coalition against the regime, which had uh, by that point was backing neither the USSR nor uh, the United States. And um, this, the regime was overthrown. And then instead of forming a kind of coalition government, the warring factions uh, went to fight with each other. So you had infamous quote unquote warlords, which was a famous phrase that the West uses to demonize uh, people engaged in power struggles who yeah, I'm sure they're just as vicious as anybody else, but no more so than uh, our foreign policy, just on a smaller scale. But uh, Farah Adid was one, uh, was probably the most notorious name that comes to mind. So people like this uh, kind of fought it out. And again, there was not really much of a Islamist element uh, at that time. And um, the US, this coincided with the famine that I mentioned. So uh, the US decided that. Um, maybe they could uh, invade Somalia 
and um, under the pretext of getting uh, aid to famine victims, they could test this new doctrine of humanitarian intervention, which was the modern version of the white man's burden. And um, they decided that uh, maybe their presence could actually help to stabilize uh, some sort of regime, which, as I mentioned in the, this Orwellian double think, it's more destabilization. But um, the declassified records show that the uh, invasion, which we call an intervention, was pretty much ad hoc. Uh, some elements of the State Department were not too enthusiastic about it. And uh, the Bush cabinet, George H.W. Bush at the time, uh, some of them were not uh, sure that this would be uh, in the U.S. interest either. So I think probably the, uh, the, the mess of the, the military uh, um, operations was probably a reflection of the mess that was going on in the the political planning at the time. So, um, he, as you mentioned, the Black Hawk Down, uh, Farah Hadid, um, and then the um, UN operations became more uh, more transparent or more obvious in the country and um, the u.s mission was basically then backing the united nations so after the black hawk down incident if we can call it that did the u.s turn tail and run or did it maintain a presence in somalia or around somalia First of all, it backed the UN mission, so it was kind of uh, in the background. Mm -hmm. But also, um, the, 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 the phrase, and it depends how you define it, because if you look at um, the Mujahideen that we were talking about, they were created by the US uh, and Britain. Britain, particularly if you read uh, Robert Dreyfus' book, Devil's Game, Britain had quite an extensive network of terrorists in Afghanistan that were sleeper cells. And it's commonly thought that, um, that it was actually the Soviet, after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in uh, 79, the US and Britain uh, started uh, organizing the Mujahideen. But in fact, um, uh, Dreyfus points out that the operations began early as 1978 for the British and the Americans to back what became the Mujahideen, so-called freedom fighters. Uh, and as uh, Carter's national security advisor, Brzezinski, put it, this had the effect of drawing the Russians into the Afghan trap, in his words. Uh, then later, they called the Mujahideen Al-Qaeda. And um, one of their uh, closest allies, although they've denied he ever worked directly for them was uh, Osama bin Laden, who uh, also uh, allegedly had the, uh, the CIA code name of Tim Osman. So um, bin Laden supposedly, so he was basically a US ally. Uh, and bin Laden had um, supposedly entered into Somalia, or at least networks close to bin Laden uh, in, the, uh, 90, in the early 90s as a result of this uh, Black Hawk Down debacle. So uh, if you wanted to put it that way, you, you could even argue that uh, the US presence in the form of bin Laden, who they helped to create, was in Somalia. Now, this isn't to suggest that he was a kind of puppet, although he might have been. Uh, it's, it's to suggest that when the US uh, creates these figures uh, and they then go off into other countries, the US has a kind of informal alliance um, where they can then point to a terrorist presence and say, ah, we must bomb this country because there are the terrorists there and the propaganda system makes sure to say uh, that, you know, make sure to omit the fact that the US and Britain created these terrorists. So right. the, the, so the U.S. presence was in the form of the uh, U.N. operations and uh, if you want to 
put it that way, the, the presence of the Al Qaeda that helped to create, uh, as I said earlier, very limited because of the, the Tim, you're breaking up quite a bit. Somali society and sort of stranglehold over Somali didn't because there were these uh, wanted to portray us uh, being uh, Somali banks, for example, and financial institutions. After 9-11, they had them. Can you hear me okay? Yep, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. You broke okay, up a bit there so, before. Okay, where did I get up to? Um, <clears throat> so essentially, we were talking about um, we were talking about Bin Laden and the uh, British participation in uh, Afghanistan, possibly starting in 1978. And then we moved uh, that up to Somalia in the early 90s. And the uh, I'm not sure what exactly you said because it broke up there. But okay. um, any anyway, so, if if yeah, if you if you'd like to cover it again, or we can. Um, well, I, I can just summarize the point that uh, the U.S. and Britain created uh, Bin Laden basically in um, Afghanistan throughout the 80s. Uh, and then uh, Bin Laden had a, a brief presence in Somalia in the 90s. So in a way, that was the U.S. presence via this proxy or ex-proxy of Bin Laden. And there was the U.S. Um, U.N. Uh, backing the U.N. presence in Somalia. And then after 9-11, George W. Bush was able to strangle uh, Somali uh, banks with sanctions. So uh, your, your question was about the U.S. presence uh, after Black Hawk Down. So it was uh, backing the U.N., having these ex-proxy terrorists in the country, uh, and then the economic sanctions. Uh, but the, uh, the main uh, U.S. Uh, invasions basically occurred uh, with um, drone and other uh, bombings in roughly the mid-2000s. So, and also what's, what's interesting just to add to that is that in the late 90s, uh, Bin Laden had a very inconspicuous presence in Sudan and was using his construction company there to build roads and other infrastructure that were badly needed and actually quite helpful to uh, much of the Sudanese population. Um, but it seems at that point, he was sort of becoming persona non grata um, in a lot of uh, geopolitical circles and in a lot of um, Arab countries as well. But again, that was, that's just to add to um, what you explained. So if we can get into the 2000s and in particular 2007 um, and then also uh, to talk about areas of responsibility or AORs in particular AFRICOM can you talk about the the genesis of that sure well the um, Somalia was invaded by uh, Ethiopia but it was basically a proxy war of the Americans and the British, which were training the Ethiopians and uh, giving logistical support. This was in um, December of 2006, because uh, what had happened was after 9-11, uh, I mentioned a while ago about these so-called warlords that the US was chasing around in the 90s. Uh, the US was employing some of them uh, after 9-11 to go and chase Islamists because, uh, again, life's always more complicated. So there were several layers to Somali politics. 
one of which was a, a coalition called the Islamic Courts Union, which, in, which included um, very sort of softer, call it left-wing elements of Islam, Sufis, all the way up to the more hard right-wing, some of which the U.S. claimed had connections with Al-Qaeda, and this justified the so-called Somalia. So uh, the U.S. Uh, the CIA was paying these uh, warlords, their former enemies, as bounty hunters to go and chase the um, elements of the Islamic Courts Union. Uh, but nevertheless, the, uh, briefly, uh, in uh, 2006, uh, in the early part, and um, numerous institutions were quite impressed with how they were able to uh, transform uh, the areas of Somalia that they controlled. We're, we're talking about one of the poorest countries on earth with a very high rate of infant mortality and maternal mortality and malnutrition. Uh, this started to decline. And um, the World Bank says that, the United Nations, different factions of the UN say this. Uh, even the Congressional Research Service in the US points to uh, the achievements of the Islamic Court. Union made. And they even go so far as to debunk the claims of the Bush administration and others that this was some sort of extremist group that uh, prevented kids from going to the cinema and that sort of thing. It turns out that they closed down cinemas because they wanted their kids in school not sneaking off to the movie. So this kind of thing gets spun by the propaganda system to say, look at these awful uh, Muslims and how they're oppressing people. Um, piracy, which is a big concern of the West, this was... Uh, the, there's so many, so much nonsense told about Somalia that I, I forget a lot of the uh, a lot of the chronology and the intervention. And then there was piracy thrown in. We have to get involved in Somalia to counter piracy. Um, European fishing vessels, at a time of famine, are stealing Somalia's fish while people are dying, and they're exporting it to more lucrative markets. So this is the big piracy. But when some smaller pirates come along and hold up Western ships that contain liquefied natural gas or whatever, uh, then it's big headlines in the West, evil Somali pirates. Well, even if you buy into that, piracy disappeared uh, when the Islamic Courts Union were uh, controlling Somalia because the pirates just basically need money and need some sort of uh, social integration, which is what the government was providing. Uh, so. Uh, but they were not necessarily, uh, it wasn't a, a government conducive to US interests at the time. So through uh, Ethiopia, the, the US just uh, went and, and smashed the, uh, the government to pieces. Uh, it was such a, a horror, uh, the, the federal government, uh, it was such a, a horror, this TFG regime, that um, tens of thousands of people fled across the Gulf of Aden uh, in rickety boats, uh, many of them drowning uh, to get to Yemen as refugees. Others went to Kenya and Ethiopia, where even to this day, thousands are, are still there in uh, refugee camps. So this is a whole generation whose lives are ruined. And we see echoes uh, with Afghanistan uh, when the uh, US and British created Mujahideen um, basically pushed the Russians to invade Afghanistan. There were three million refugees. Many of them went to Iran. Most of them went to Pakistan. And the kids in the refugee camps in Pakistan were being brainwashed by the very Al-Qaeda, later they called them Al-Qaeda terrorists that uh, the West was backing. And they grew up to be the Taliban. And we see a similar situation in terms of the brutality inflicted on refugees uh, in Somalia. So this was a terrible uh, humanitarian crisis and it got almost no attention uh, in Western media. Uh, the focus was on pirates or terrorists. And um, the, um, the regime pretty much uh, 
brutalised the population. Uh, we found that uh, the British had um, set up uh, the Somali National Security Agency, for example, with British taxpayer money funneled through an aid programme. And this was in the <clears throat> mid to late 2000s? Yeah, that would have been um, December 2006 was the invasion. And then there was pretty much uh, just chaos and warring factions and different uh, governments coming and going. Um, pretty much continued up to the present. So, so I remember when I, the ICU or Islamic Courts Union was in the mainstream media here and it barely merited a mention and was almost dismissed outright as um, yet another Islamist regime in Somalia. And of course, if you read other media sources, you would very quickly find out that that wasn't the case. But nonetheless, Al-Shabaab started to come onto the scene in around 2007, which was also the year that Bush Jr. began bombing, I suppose, uh, Somalia, Al-Shabaab uh, specifically, um, or so that was the stated aim. But can you break down what exactly Al-Shabaab is as a group and, and where it comes from, because even to this day, there's still a lot of murkiness around its origins and um, what exactly constitutes uh, Al-Shabaab. Yep, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, so, so Al-Shabaab. Yeah, so... I had asked you about the the genesis of Al Shabaab and if you could clear up some of the murkiness surrounding it, because especially now we hear Al Shabaab and we immediately think Al Qaeda, um, but there's a lot more to it than that. It's much more complex than that. So, can you talk about when Al Shabaab? started to come onto the scene, so to speak? It translates basically as the youth wing. So it was uh, the youth wing of the Islamic Courts Union. That's all it was. And because the there were some, and I stress some, more right-wing militant Islamist uh, factions of the Islamic Courts Union, when the uh, Islamic Courts Union was smashed to pieces by the Ethiopians who were basically puppets of the Americans and the British. Um, the the youth wing, Al-Shabaab, uh, they took up arms and became, um, quote unquote, a radicalized force, which, again, I, I've mentioned propaganda terminology throughout this discussion, and we should always be aware that uh, what appears radicalized from the outside is uh, a quite normal response to being treated with extreme violence from the point of view of the people who are being uh, tortured, basically. So while the transitional federal government, which was backed by Ethiopia and Britain and America, were going around uh, torturing Somalis and uh, fighting this brutal war, uh, the Al-Shabaab uh, elements were becoming more uh, radicalized and hardline and uh, resisting the TFG. But um, I'm not going to remember the, the names of the specific leaders, but uh, at some point it was alleged in, um, I think, 2013, after several failed Al-Shabaab uh, military efforts against um, a U.S. presence and against the TFG, that um, the uh, leaders of the group decided that they were actually fighting a losing battle. And uh, the U.S. then alleged that they had uh, pledged allegiance to um, al-Qaeda, which again, remember, was uh, created by Britain and the U.S., basically. So what this meant, of course, was that um, 
all of the the claims that the Bush administration had been making all along that uh, Somalia is a, a haven for terrorists and for Al Qaeda, uh, this suddenly became uh, true. Again, if you believe the propaganda, it's important to stress that uh, militaries and the CIA they have um, psychological warfare units, they have uh, counterintelligence units. So. How do we know that some statement that's floating around on the internet saying we pledge allegiance to Al Qaeda, how do we know that that's not just counterintelligence? There was an example of that happening in um, in the early years of the invasion of Iraq. In uh, I think 2004, there was um, supposedly this uh, Jordanian uh, terrorist called um, Zarqawi. Z- Zarqawi, exactly, and um, he was supposed to have uh, written a, a letter to Osama bin Laden laying out a plan for how he was going to uh, sow the seeds of a, a civil war in Iraq between the Sunni and the Shia. And this was almost certainly a fake. There were several uh, terrorism experts at the time who said this is very unlikely. And then uh, a reporter called Thomas Ricks in the Washington Post revealed that um, the U.S., uh, in his words, was inflating the caricature of the Karwi to blame him for all the um, all the attacks that were going on, and how the U.S. military uh, counterintelligence and psychological warfare units were targeting American domestic audiences by saying um, it's all Zarqawi's fault, uh, when in fact on other occasions, like in Basra, for example. Uh, British SAS units were caught uh, about to stage a a false flag attack and the Iraqis captured them. And then years later, it was revealed uh, by the Bureau of of Investigative Journalists that um, a PR firm, whose name I can never remember, uh, but anyway, they had been paid by the uh, Defense Department to create fake Al-Qaeda videos. So a lot of this stuff, you really have to question, is this even real or is this just army uh, counterintelligence? But anyway, if we believe the propaganda, then um, Al-Shabaab in Somalia pledged allegiance to Al-Qaeda formally in 2013. Uh, By then, of course, um, it was uh, Obama um, or Obama, as many people were calling him, and he uh, vastly uh, increased the drone attacks. in, in both in Pakistan and in Somalia, actually, uh, relative to the Bush administration, uh, all of which was a, a long-term military goal. Even before 9-11, there's the infamous Project for the New American Century document, which talks about how um, a catastrophic event would enable the U.S., in their words, to project U.S. power with drones in strategically significant areas. And that's exactly what they did after 9-11. And um, so the um, and then it, with, with the with um, so-called Islamic State coming on the scene, the situation gets even more complicated and uh, even more murky. Um, and there were reports of uh, British special forces uh, operating in Somalia too, uh, supposedly to counter terrorists, because uh, Al Shabaab attacks. Uh, then expanded into neighboring countries like Kenya, which uh, I'm certainly not going to justify terrorism against civilians. But the context is always missing in the Western propaganda that uh, Kenya was part of the operations against the Islamic Courts Union and Al-Shabaab in Somalia. So the the nation is not uh, some blameless victim fighting evil. It's It's part of the the same neo-colonial nexus. And Ethiopia still occupies a region of Somalia, is that correct? Yeah, the Ogaden region. And I think there was uh, briefly a a war that was fought. Uh, I believe this was in the 80s, but my dates might be wrong here. But anyway, after the, the failed Somali attempt to reclaim Ogaden, Uh, the Somali regime realized it could not rely on uh, USSR support. And I think that's when the US really shifted to arming it. But that's um, 
because Somalia now has uh, so many of its internal um, desperate struggles, I think that the Ogaden issue has been uh, put on the back burner as far as Somali politicians are concerned. And Ethiopia, of course, is going through its own civil war as we speak. So <clears throat> going from there, I think it's important to highlight the civilian toll, or at least what we know about the uh, civilian toll that all this has taken in Somalia. Um, you quote in your piece for the gray zone, uh, I'm forgetting his position, but essentially he says in uh, 95, I believe it is, um, when asked about the civilian death toll that he's, I'm paraphrasing because you have the quote, but he's not interested in counting bodies. And that put me in mind of something uh, Schwarzkopf said during the first Gulf War that we're not in the business of uh, body counts, uh, something to that effect. I think that's pretty close. Um, and that, of course, yeah. was when Schwarzkopf was asked about uh, the highway of death in particular, and essentially American bulldozers burying uh, Iraqi soldiers alive in the trenches they had dug out in the desert, um, or deserts, I should say. So, and as you point out in your piece, it's because of that lack of reporting, um, you know, which is actually an obligation of, of the military under international law, but because of the lack of that reporting on the, the civilian toll, it's, we don't really have a clear picture of how detrimental it's been to um, Somali civilians. But in your, in your research, have you been able to get um, a clearer picture of the civilian toll, um, you know, beyond what military officials um, have revealed, if they've revealed anything? It would appear from organizations like uh, Air Wars and the Bureau of Investigative Journalists that the U.S. bombing through drones and uh, other uh, aircraft has caused uh, in the low thousands of deaths. The civil war, quote unquote, which actually was the US, British, Ethiopian war. Um, am I still there? Yep. Oh yeah, I just got, uh, my battery's gonna die soon, so I'll have to speed it up. But anyway, okay. the, um, the Ethiopian uh, invasion uh, basically caused tens of thousands of deaths. But the worst crime is the systemic factor, which is when you smash a fragile country with a hammer, it sends ripple effects across the aid agencies and the logistics. So according to Oxfam, uh, about a quarter of a million people died in the most recent famine a few years ago. So we're talking, at, uh, you know, maybe 300,000 deaths. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. It's hard to tell sometimes because it gets a bit pixelated and I can't tell if it's frozen. But, okay, so to sort of bring it to a close, um, we've been hearing Biden... Um, in his remarks about Afghanistan, talking about the U.S. military um, carrying out counterterrorism activity in countries where it doesn't have uh, an official military presence. And these are almost his words verbatim, basically admitting that the U.S. is waging informal wars in other countries. Um, and in July, the Biden administration began bombing Somalia. Um, the U.S. began bombing Somalia yet again, um, using Al Shabaab as the uh, the pretense for that. And it seemed like with the so-called withdrawal from Afghanistan that 
the U.S. was going to um, pivot, to use one of the buzzwords, to to Africa um, and increase its imperial footprint there, which has already been quite large. Um, but it seems like that might be on the back burner or it could still go forward um, and, and be obscured by what's happening in Afghanistan. But can you talk about um, the bombings that began in July and, and where you see um, in particular Somalia uh, going uh, under all of this and perhaps the rest of AFRICOM's purview in general, where, where you see um, the countries that are under its under its dominance, um, what kind of future you see? Um, and of course, I'm not asking you to predict the future, but basically give an assessment based on, based on your research. Well, the U.S. is uh, committed to what they call full spectrum dominance. This was a space command statement from 1997 in the vision for 2020. And there has been no withdrawal of that doctrine, though it still stands, uh, in their words, to protect U.S. interests and investment. And it involves dominating, again, in their words, land, sea, air, space, and now cyberspace information. So that's everything. And um, the U.S. divides uh, the world into what they call areas of responsibility. So the Central Command has uh, Central Asia and most of the Middle East, as well as Egypt. Uh, and with the exception of Egypt, the AFRICOM, which was created under George W. Bush and expanded under Obama, uh, that has the self-appointed area of responsibility of every African country. So the ones that uh, AFRICOM is mostly interested in are the ones that have uh, strategic resources or uh, geostrategic interests. So uh, Libya was really the first major AFRICOM uh, war destruction of the country, it killed 30,000 people, ruined the country. That's, uh, Libya also has the uh, largest uh, oil reserves in Africa. Uh, next on the list, if you look at the AFRICOM statements of uh, intent, it's Nigeria, because that also has uh, either the largest, joint largest or second largest oil deposits. And it's also a strategic route because of its position on the sea and the ocean. Uh, and then you've got uh, Somalia, which I mentioned earlier, for strategic force deployment. So I would say the future is going to be um, a new Cold War with China, China this, China that, China's here, China's under the bed, same as it was uh, with the Russians, uh, and still is actually with Russia Gate and all this stuff, mm -hmm. uh, and also with uh, the so-called war on terror. Uh, so we're going to see the claim, probably, I mean, again, I don't know, I'm not a military strategist, but probably the withdrawal from Afghanistan was to create a vacuum for China to fill so that the US can now say, oh, China's gotten into Afghanistan. We have to ramp up a cold war against China. Uh, so China also has a foothold in several African countries, like many nations do. So the U.S. can point to this uh, these small uh, footholds or feetholds and say that we have to now uh, some somehow intervene, whether it's humanitarian intervention or helping people that are under uh, Chinese rule in Africa, like um, Sudan a few years ago, for example. In fact, while the, the Darfur atrocities were going on, which China was backing partly, uh, the what was happening in Somalia at the time that I mentioned was pretty much ignored by the media. Uh, and that's because that was us doing it in Somalia. Uh, but it was the Chinese doing it uh, partly in Darfur. So the media could focus on Darfur and uh, ignore Somalia. So um, this is the, uh, but it doesn't have to be this way. If people, particularly with uh, grassroots solidarity, um, I know the trade unions are pretty much a skeleton of what they used to be, but uh, uh, workers' unions and cooperatives that could form international alliances with working class people in foreign countries. This is one way. Reviving the uh, anti-war uh, movement 
is uh, another way because it was pretty strong uh, with, against George W. Bush, but uh, it utterly faltered when Barack Obama became the president. So um, a new anti-war movement, maybe also to uh, get engaged with the um, climate activists to explain just how much the military pollutes and how what a detriment to the environment it is to have such war and uh, oil. Uh, so this this could be a strategic advantage for grassroots activists to uh, at least try and limit or reduce some of this uh, imperialism. I think that's a, a good note to end on. Um, I want to say optimistic, but of course we have to be careful how we couch our terms in, in regard to imperialism because uh, optimism usually isn't on the menu. And uh, I just want to say that I was struck by something you said earlier about how the mainstream media will report on a group like Al-Shabaab and we are sort of taking their word for it, which is coming from the word of the military. And I think an interesting uh, parallel to draw there and probably a parallel of substance is what we're seeing now with ISIS-K in Afghanistan. Yeah. It wasn't on the radar at all um, two weeks ago, and now it's ISIS-K everywhere, and the media is just running with it. And I think that's something we have to keep an eye on, too, especially if you go back and look at the origins, the so-called origins of ISIS-K, and see that it's essentially like al-Shabaab, an invention of the U.S. and other Western imperial powers and um, is being used as a justification, much like al-Shabaab, to maintain Western imperial dominance and, uh, you know, always having a boogeyman to, to trot out to, to justify that dominance. And so, so. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I think what we've been talking about in Somalia, um, we're seeing sort of a mirror image of that in Afghanistan right now. Um, and we have, as we've discussed for, for many decades. So um, yeah, it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting and uh, certainly and anxiety. I, I found anxiety. It, um, Go ahead. Sorry, I, I found it interesting that um, I was watching uh, Steve Bannon's War Room and uh, Eric Prince called in the infamous uh, mercenary war criminal uh, of Blackwater and now whatever they call it, Academy or something. Academy, yeah, with and, an I. Yeah, that's right. And Bannon was there saying, oh, we got Eric Prince. He's, he's calling in right now from Afghanistan. And I thought, hmm, interesting timing that, there, that there's a mercenary uh, right there. And now suddenly there are these explosions taking place. Right. Yeah, so I, like, I have a lot of suspicions about what's taking place there, um, especially after the bombings or bombing. There's uh, some dispute as to whether there was one or two. Um, but uh, yeah, also Prince um, organizing flights out of Afghanistan for something like $5,000 a piece. Um, which but he is, didn't course, do it for the money, he said. Right, right. <laughs> he, he's never done any of this for the money. <laughs> It's just out of his own benevolence and the, the, uh, the goodness of the sucking that used to be a heart. Yeah, his his mer merchant of death's heart. <laughs> <laughs> or so, maybe where there never was a heart. Right, right. So uh, all of which is to say that um, you know we need to pay attention. I think very closely to what's happening in Somalia and and the rest of Africa as well, because as you said, AFRICOM's footprint there it basically covers the whole continent. Um, so thank you so much again for joining us. And um, it would be great to have you back on to discuss this further as it develops, because it's certainly going to. So um, our guest today has been Tim Coles. He is a postdoctoral research fellow at Plymouth University in the UK. Uh, he's currently living in France though, so doing his work remotely. Um, and he recently published a piece at the Gray Zone 
which uh, let me pull up one more time so I can plug the title because I think this is an excellent deconstruction uh, what we just talked about. In Somalia, the US is bombing the very terrorists it created, and you have terrorists in quotes in, yeah, in the title. That, which... that, that was uh, Max Blumenthal's insertion of quotes. So the credit goes to him if you want to. <laughs> right on. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's appropriate, though. So um, thanks again, Tim, and uh, look forward to talking again soon. Thanks very much. OK, take, take care. care. Bye.